Hello, I'm Alma Angelos, and you're watching Eagle News International on tonight's headlines. Russia plans to open humanitarian corridors in Ukraine for civilians to flee besieged cities. But Kiev insists the move is a publicity stunt and people will not be able to escape. The United Nations needs safe passage to deliver humanitarian aid to conflict zones in Ukraine, according to a senior official with the organization telling the Security Council. To avoid a possible conflict with China, President Duterte enjoined the next administration to honor the Philippines' commitment to the proposed joint oil exploration with China in the resource-rich West Philippine Sea. An airstrike killed at least nine people, including two children, in the Ukrainian city of Sumy, where a humanitarian corridor was to be set up Tuesday, according to authorities. The corridor from Sumy to Poltava is designed to evacuate civilians, including Chinese, Indians, and other foreigners. But Ukraine's vice prime minister accused Russia of planning to disrupt the route. Ukraine's rescue services said the airstrike in Sumy, near the Russian border east of the Ukrainian capital Kiev, took place late Monday. Sumy, 350 kilometers east of Kiev, has experienced heavy fighting for days, but no other details about the attack were immediately available. Irina Vershuk, Ukraine's vice prime minister, said the Russian defense ministry had agreed to start the corridor early Tuesday in a letter to the International Committee of the Red Cross. She also said the corridor was also designed to channel the delivery of food and medicine. The vice prime minister said the first convoy was supposed to begin at 10 a.m., one hour after the start of what Ukraine hopes is a ceasefire that is due to last until 9 p.m. She called on Russia to urgently coordinate humanitarian corridors from the cities of Volnakava, Mariupol, as well as from Kiev, Kharkiv, and their surrounding regions. The Pentagon said Russia is recruiting Syrians and other foreign fighters as it ramps up its assault on Ukraine. U.S. Department of Defense officials said Russia's President Vladimir Putin was on a recruiting mission seeking to bring some of those fighters into the fray in Ukraine. Take a look. We do believe, as I said to Jen, that they are having morale problems. Uh, they are having supply problems. Uh, they are having fuel problems. They are having food problems. They are, ha they are, having, they are meeting a very stiff and determined Ukrainian resistance. Um, and uh, we still maintain that they are several days behind what they probably thought they were going to be in terms of their progress. But I can't, honestly, I, I, I cannot get inside, you know, Mr. Putin's brain as to why he would find it necessary to seek support from foreign fighters. Uh, we do believe that the, the accounts of them, the Russians uh, seeking uh, uh, Syrian fighters to, to augment their forces in Ukraine, we, uh, we believe there's truth to that. Um, so it's interesting that, uh, that Mr. Putin would have to find himself relying on foreign fighters here. Who they are going to be, how many they're getting, what they're going to pay them, all of that we don't have perfect visibility on, but we're in no position. Moscow entered the Syrian civil war in 2015 on the side of President Bashar al-Assad's regime and the country has been mired in a conflict marked by urban combat for more than a decade. According to the Wall Street Journal, U.S. officials said that Russia has in recent days recruited fighters from Syria hoping they can help take the capital Kiev and other cities. One official told the Daily that some fighters are already in Russia, readying to join the fight in Ukraine, though it was not immediately clear how many combatants have been recruited. Chechnya strongman leader Ramzan Kadyrov, a former rebel-turned-Kremlin ally, has shared videos of Chechen fighters joining the attack on Ukraine and said some had been killed in the fighting. Ukrainian Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba has claimed around 20,000 Foreign volunteers have traveled to the countries to join Kiev's forces. Meanwhile, Dr. Catherine Smallwood, senior emergency officer at the World Health Organization Europe, tells a press conference that they have recorded at least nine deaths from 16 attacks on healthcare services during Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Take a look. We've had documented or verified 16 attacks with different levels of certainty. Um, these have led to what we know of at least nine deaths and 16 injuries. And they've happened 
um, in various large cities um, and around the areas of conflict line. Many of those are, have been reported in the public domain, um, but we keep some of those details um, uh, not in the public domain for purposes of protecting healthcare um, and not putting them at risk. But this includes direct attacks against health facilities or hospitals that have been damaged. Um, this also includes um, appropriating health infrastructure such as ambulances. It includes diverting ambulances and using them for um, uh, purposes that are not directly related to the provision of healthcare. Meanwhile, the number of refugees fleeing the war in Ukraine is expected to top 2 million in the next two days. That is according to the head of the UN Refugee Agency. On Monday, the UNHCR put the number of refugees at more than 1.7 million. Filippo Grandi, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, made his remarks at a press conference after visiting Moldova, Poland and Romania, all of which have received refugees pouring across the border from Ukraine since Russia invaded the country on February 24. For comparison, Grandi said the Balkan Wars in Bosnia and Kosovo saw maybe two to three million people, but over a period of eight years. While other parts of the world have seen this, Grandi added, in Europe, it's the first time since the Second World War. Meanwhile, European Union Foreign Policy Chief Josep Borrell said the EU must be prepared to host 5 million people from Ukraine ahead of a meeting for EU ministers in Montpellier and southern France. Take a look. Il faut avoir une vision plus politique de notre aide pour faire de sorte que la communauté internationale d'abord condamne l'action de la Russie, établisse une coalition pour aider les réfugiés ukrainiens pour supporter l'Ukraine, aussi bien ceux qui sont à l'intérieur et continuent la bataille, et ceux qui sont partis pour échapper, pour sauver sa vie, et auxquels il faut donner euh, un accueil euh, comme on a fait. L'Afghanistan, c'est un mauvais exemple, parce qu'on n'a pas reçu 5 millions d'Afghans en Europe. Dans ces cas, il faut se préparer à recevoir aux alentours de 5 millions de personnes. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky accused Moscow of cynicism while stating that he is staying in Kiev in a video posted on Telegram. Take a look. Причому вони роблять так, щоб відкрився невеличкий коридор на окуповану територію на кілька десятків людей. Не так у Росію, як до пропагандистів, прямо до них на телекамери. Мовляв, ось хто рятує. Ось вони. Просто цинізм, просто пропаганда. Нічого більше. Я залишаюсь тут, залишаюсь у Києві, на Банковій, не ховаючись. І нікого не боюсь. Стільки, скільки потрібно, щоб перемогти у цій нашій вітчизняній війні. Не Київ. A Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, on Monday accused the Russian army of scuppering the evacuation of civilians through humanitarian corridors, agreed after talks with Moscow. The Ukrainian leader also said Russian forces mined the road chosen to bring food and medicine to the besieged city of Mariupol in southern Ukraine, accusing Moscow of cynicism. Zelensky also said Russian troops destroyed buses that were due to evacuate civilians from the combat zones. But Zelensky added that Kiev would continue to negotiate with Russia to reach a peace deal. Russia on Monday morning had announced the creation of corridors to allow civilians to leave several besieged Ukrainian cities with the humanitarian situation deteriorating as supplies start to run low. But Ukraine refused to evacuate civilians to Russia as four of Moscow's six proposed corridors led to Russia or its ally, Belarus. Meanwhile, the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, vowed that his city will not go down without a fight in an address posted on his Instagram account. Take a look. Зараз в Бучі, в Ірпіні, в Гостомілі наші хлопці зараз іде бій в цей момент. І одне можу сказати, що з Києва ми нікуди не підемо. 
кожен будинок, кожна вулиця, кожен блокпост буде стояти на смерть, якщо це буде потрібно. Ніхто не хоче вмирати, ніхто не хоче загинути, але якщо потрібно буде, ми будемо захищати в першу чергу наших дітей, наші сім'ї, наші будинки руйнують, наше майбутнє хочуть вкрасти, нас хочуть взяти в поле. І цього не відбудеться. Я переконаний в тому. І дякую кожному патріоту, який сьогодні готовий захищати свої домівки і наше спільне майбутнє. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky also called on international partners to adopt new sanctions against Russia if Russia does not abandon its plans, including a ban on Russian oil and petroleum exports. International sanctions intended to punish Moscow have so far done little to slow the invasion, and the United States says it is now discussing a ban on Russian oil imports with Europe. Take a look. Якщо вторгнення продовжується і Росія не відмовилась від своїх планів проти України, значить потрібен новий санкційний пакет. Нові санкції, нові санкційні кроки проти війни заради миру. Байкот російського експорту. Зокрема, відмова від нафти і нафтопродуктів з Росії. Це можна називати ембарго, а можна просто моралью. Коли відмовляєшся давати гроші терористу. Скільки ще потрібно смертей і втрат, щоб убезпечити небо над Україною? Чим мирні люди у Харкові чи Миколаєві відрізняються від Гамбургу або Відня? Ми чекаємо рішення. Meanwhile, energy giant Shell said Tuesday it would now withdraw from its involvement in Russian gas and oil, including an immediate stop to purchases of crude from the country. The company also said it would shut its service stations, aviation fuels and lubricants operations in Russia. Meanwhile, 130 Belgian soldiers are boarding a plane from Brussels military airport to Romania as part of NATO's rapid reaction force in the context of war in Ukraine. Take a look. Euh, la Belgique, l'OTAN, on n'a fait aucune menace par rapport à la, la Russie. La seule chose qu'on fait, c'est quand on voit qu'il y a une menace qui vient de leur côté, c'est de montrer euh, jusqu'ici et pas plus loin. Ce qui se passe en Ukraine, on n'est pas du tout d'accord, mais c'est clair que par rapport au territoire de l'OTAN, on, on ne permettrait pas qu'il qu soit une atteinte par rapport à, notre, à nos frontières. Parce qu'effectivement, c'est la première fois depuis la création de l'OTAN que cette force de réaction rapide est déployée, que nous envoyons ici plusieurs centaines de militaires pour protéger les frontières de l'OTAN. Parce qu'effectivement, personne n'y croyait, mais il y a une guerre sur le continent européen. Et donc je pense... Meanwhile, Ukrainians are fleeing south towards Kiev across a bombed-out bridge as Russian forces continue to bombard the town of Irpin, northwest of the capital. Take a look. Просто у нас не было дома света. Нет света, нет воды. Давно? Уже дня три. 
просто в подвале сидели под домом, в темноте. У нас там немножко продуктов было, но мы понимаем, нам никто их не привезет. И постоянно слышны взрывы, некоторые очень сильные, прям рядом. Попадали в соседние дома. Вот. Мы видели огонь, взрывы. Рядом с нашим домом стоят машины, в ней убитые люди. Вот. Ну, страшно очень. In London, Prime Minister Boris Johnson gave a press conference with his Canadian and Dutch counterparts. Uh, Justin Trudeau and Mark Rutte, after the leaders discussed their response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Here's Patricia Rodriguez for the report. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson gave a press conference in London with his Canadian and Dutch counterparts, Justin Trudeau and Mark Rutte, after the leaders discussed their response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Johnson announced an additional £175 million of UK aid for Ukraine, while Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau on Monday announced new sanctions against 10 people he said were complicit in the unjustified invasion of Ukraine. This includes former and current senior government officials, oligarchs, and supporters of the Russian leadership. Trudeau said the names of those sanctioned came from a list compiled by the jailed Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. He told reporters that the sanctions put increased pressure on Russia's leadership, including President Vladimir Putin's inner circle. Trudeau adds that this is an addition to all the other sanctions they've put out, including their recent announcement on imposing massive tariffs on Russian and Belarusian imports. The government in Ottawa last week revoked special trading status for Russia and Belarus because of Moscow's invasion, resulting in 35% tariffs. Let's listen in to the world leaders' statements at their joint conference held here in London. This is the moment for Ukraine's friends to create a coalition of humanitarian, economic and defensive military support to ensure that Putin fails. And that's why today I'm announcing a further £175 million of UK aid for Ukraine, $100 million of which will be provided directly to the Ukrainian government. After 12 days, it's already clear that Putin has made a miscalculation. He has underestimated the Ukrainians, their heroic resistance. He's underestimated their leader. And he has underestimated the unity of the West. And we will continue as colleagues to do everything we can to strengthen that unity in the days ahead to ensure that Putin fails in this catastrophic invasion of Ukraine. The work we're doing together is punishing Putin and his enablers where it hurts most, in particular by crippling their financial systems and sanctioning their central bank. Today, Canada is announcing new sanctions on 10 individuals complicit in this unjustified invasion. This includes former and current senior government officials, oligarchs and supporters of Russian leadership. The names of these individuals come from a list compiled by jailed opposition leader Alexei Navalny. These sanctions put increased pressure on Russia's leadership, including on Putin's inner circle. Reporting from London, United Kingdom, I'm Patricia Rodriguez. We live in interesting times. Thank you, Patricia. Eagle News will be right back. Stay tuned. Mr. Bauer, baby, let's go. What's on? <laughs> it's a prank. Okay lang manakot. Pero kung mananakot ka para sa boto, bawal yan. Ayon sa Omnibus Election Code, threats, intimidation, terrorism, use of fraudulent device or other forms of coercion is an election offense. 
Sino ka usap mo? Baka alis na nga sa iba na lang ako mananakot. Mr. Pwede! Mr. Pwede! May malaking ipis sa likod mo! Nox! Pabawi ka pa! Di mo ako maiisahan! Ako si Mr. Bawal na nagpapaalala sa inyo na ang pananakot para sa boto. Ah! Ipis! Hoy! Bawal yan! A public service message of Net25 for Mata ng Halalan 2022. Matatag, matapang, matapat. Alam namin ang iyong pagsisikap. Dama namin ang iyong mga sakripisyo. Kita namin ang pagharap mo sa bawat pagsubok. Kaya sa kabila ng mga hamon ng buhay, nandito kami para umalalay. Kasi katulad mo, gusto rin namin ang magandang bukas para sa kanya. Hatid namin ang dekalidad na edukasyon at makabagong pasilidad sa abot kayang halaga. Kaya huwag ka nang mangamba, sasamahan ka namin to pa rin ang mga pangarap niya. Maaasahan mong sulit dito ang mga pinagsikapan mo. Sa aming mga makabagong pasilidad at sistema ng edukasyon, Ilalabas natin ang aking talino at mga kakayahan niya. Kahit sa munting halaga, makakasiguro ka na makakasabay siya sa mabilis na pag-ikot ng mundo. Sa new era, karamay mo kami sa bawat hamon. Kaagapay mo kami sa bawat hakbang. Kasama mo kami sa bawat niti. At tagumpay. ibinibigay ng Commission on Elections para magparehistro ang mga Pilipinong boboto sa darating na eleksyon. Kailangan gawin ito para maiwasan ang tinatawag na flying voters. Teka, lahat ba kayo nagparehistro na? Opo, isang na kami lahat. Bakit tahimik ka? Hindi ka nakapagrehistro, no? Nakalimutan ko. Ay, hindi na pwedeng boboto. Pabuti pa, bumili ka na lang ng balot. Kapag ka kami pa bumili ng balot, eh, pwede na kami boboto. Hindi. Pero, mabubusog ka! <laughs> Para sa kanagdagang kaalaman, makipag-ugnayan lang sa pinakamalapit na barangay o bisitahin ang Comelec website. A public service message of Net25 for Mata ng Halalan 2022. Matatag, matapang, matapat! Welcome back. 21 Filipino seafarers who were extracted from war-torn Ukraine have arrived in the Philippines according to the Department of Foreign Affairs. Now, the MVS Breeze, a ball carrier, had been on dry dock for repairs at the uh, Ilyichevich shipyard in Port of Odessa, Ukraine, when it, Russia invaded the European nation in February. It's all Filipino crew members were extracted from Odessa to Moldova with the help of Gaina and coordination with the Philippine Embassy in Budapest. The latest arrival brings to at least 56 the number of people with the DFA or people the DFA has sent to the Philippines since tensions escalated in Ukraine, the most recent of which were on March 6 and 7, when seven Filipino nationals, five children, and four Ukrainian nationals arrived in Manila. Ukraine is under alert level four, meaning evacuation for Filipinos there is mandatory due to the deteriorating security situation. In an advisory on Friday last week, the DFA said humanitarian corridors that would allow evacuees to exit Ukraine through borders in Moldova and Romania are also being eyed. 
Now, to avoid a possible conflict with China, President Duterte enjoined the next administration to honor the Philippines' commitment to the proposed joint oil exploration with China in the resource-rich West Philippine Sea. Citing Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's claims in Taiwan, the president said there are already so many flashpoints around the world that he didn't want the Philippines to be involved in any conflict. Take a look. Namin ito sinasabi kong ano, not so that uh, hindi maalarma yung tao. Pero pinakadelikado ito ngayong nangyayari. Kasi pag may nagkamali dito, pag uh, nabitawan yung mga nuclear warheads, uh, problema talaga, problema na. Uh, ano, alam mo, pinaalaala sa akin, Hindi ko lang sabihin kung sino. Uh, from China, sabi niya, di ba may usapan tayo na uh, joint uh, development yang sa Recto Ridge, sa, sa Recto Bank. Huwag ganun. Yung, yung original contracts natin, sundin natin. Ngayon na sabi, magpadala ng sundalo. Sabi na, Wala, wala, sabi ko, wala, mag, wala mang kami sinabi yung padala ng sundalo. Sabi niya, eh, just in case. Magpadala kayo ng sundalo, magpadala rin kami ng sundalo. So, alam mo, yan ang iniiwasan ko noon pa eh. Tapos, magkagaira tuloy tayo dito, nandoon sa Ukraine, nandyan yung Taiwan, gustong agawin uli ng China. Tapos dito, mag... So many flashpoints. Maraming lugar na may potok. We do not need it. Hindi natin kailangan makipag-away dyan. Sundin lang nila, sundin lang ninyo kung ano yung pinag-usapan noon. Honor yan eh. It's a matter of honor. We gave our... Consensual... Uh, Talks, tapos may, may written agreement. Pag iba, iniba yan, delikado. So. He also said, although the Philippines and China may not be able to have a peaceful resolution to the zero during his administration, what mattered now is to remain calm amid the crisis. There are presently no agreements reached between the Philippines and China when it comes to joint exploration activities for oil and gas at the diplomatically strained sea. The two countries signed a memorandum of understanding on joint oil and gas development in the West Philippine Sea in November 2018. Philippine and Chinese officials are still in the process of fleshing out possible details of any joint exploration venture. Meanwhile, President Duterte is also now considering calling for a special session in Congress to pass legislation to reduce the impact of the Ukraine-Russia crisis on the country's economy. In his public address last Monday, the president said he will look into the recommendation of the Economic Development Cluster, or EDC, to ask lawmakers to pass laws related to protecting consumers against the anticipated surge in the price of basic goods and services. He also issued a statement after Socio-Economic Planning Secretary Carl Kendrick Chua disclosed at least two of their proposed measures to mitigate the effects of the Ukraine-Russia turmoil that will need to go through legislation. Take a look. The first is on the overall economy is to shift to alert level one at the soonest possible time for the entire country and open all the schools for face-to-face -face learning to increase our domestic economy and offset the external risk. So while we cannot uh, prevent the risk from coming from the global uh, perspective, we can strengthen our domestic economy to provide the people with more jobs and opportunities. The second one on gasoline and diesel, as you know, the price of gasoline and diesel has went up so much. The first is to increase fuel subsidy program for public utility vehicles from the already announced 2.5 billion to 5 billion. So we will double the subsidy. And the first tranche will be given in March and the second tranche in April. And we promote non-wheat flour substitute, flour substitute 
such as yung sagip new tree flower na gawa sa cassava, sweet potato, mongo, and banana flower. Uh, all of these uh, are meant to ensure that we have adequate bread at affordable prices. And uh, finally, Mr. President, since itong uh, renewable energy and agriculture napakahalaga uh, sa atin, we propose that we include it in the strategic investment priority plan under the Board of Investment para mabigyan ng sapat na attention, may investors na pumasok para i-increase yung supply ng ating uh, pagkain at yung energy. Baka lalampas na yun sa kabila. Okay. And I just hope that they would, you know, read your uh, okay. study very carefully. Mr. President, if the situation escalates, uh, we could recommend a special session if mag-escalate po. Mas mabuti pa sa okay? Pag-isip pa na lang natin yan. Itong recommendations ng NEDA is really uh, vital to the to keep the economy humming uh, for, uh, for a few months. To pandemic news now, over 6 million people have died worldwide from COVID-19 since the pandemic began, according to a tally from official sources compiled by AFP on Tuesday. A total of 6,001,585 people have succumbed to the virus, according to an AFP count at 0900 GMT. The milestone comes as the number of infections and deaths continues to plummet in most regions of the world, except in Asia where Hong Kong is suffering its worst ever outbreak and Oceania, where New Zealand has recorded a jump in cases. Average global daily deaths over the past seven days have fallen to 7,170, down 18% in a week, continuing a trend seen since the peak of the Omicron wave in mid-February, despite many countries relaxing restrictions. The United States has recorded 960,311 deaths from COVID, followed by Brazil on 652,341 and India on 515,102. Meanwhile, U.S. vaccine maker Moderna announced that it would build its first mRNA jab manufacturing facility in Africa after signing an agreement with Kenya's government to produce up to 500 million doses a year. The company said it expected to invest 500 million dollars or 460 million euros in the new facility, which will produce vaccines for um, the continent of 1.3 billion people whose population has been largely shut out of access to COVID jabs. Moderna said it hopes to use the facility to supply doses of its COVID jab to African nations as early as next year in a bid to boost vaccine coverage on the world's least immunized continent. Moderna's announcement follows a decision by the World Health Organization to create a global mRNA vaccine hub in South Africa last year, with Kenya among six African nations selected to be the first recipients of technology aimed at enabling local manufacturers to make jabs. WHO Chief Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus has repeatedly called for equitable access to vaccines in order to beat the pandemic and attack wealthy nations for hogging doses. A record 71,000 people, including 63,000 residents, fled Hong Kong in February amid fears infected children could be separated from their parents as the city follows China's orders to curb a severe COVID-19 outbreak. Travel restrictions have been hard on Hong Kong's foreign workers who make up nearly 10% of the population. Borders have been effectively sealed to visitors and residents who do return have faced two to three weeks in expensive hotel quarantines throughout most of the pandemic. The government was caught flat-footed with few plans in place to deal with a mass Omicron-fueled outbreak. Hospitals and morgues were quickly overwhelmed and the city's current death rate is four times Singapore's mostly accounted for by unvaccinated early residents. Panic buying has stripped shelves bare. Schools remain shuttered. Summer holidays have been brought forward so classrooms can be used for mass testing. Companies and industry groups have been increasingly public in their talent drain warnings. The European Union's local office estimates 10% of its nationals have left since the pandemic began. Multiple airlines have reported a surge of bookings in 
in recent weeks, while shipping container prices have doubled in a year. The current exodus adds to a wave of migration already underway of uh, local Hong Kongers, which began after China cracked down against democracy protests. Between June 2020 and June 2021, Hong Kong saw its biggest population decrease in 60 years, and there is little sign that that is changing. Meanwhile, China reported its highest number of COVID cases, more than 500 in two years, as clusters emerge in more than a dozen cities, posing a fresh challenge to Beijing's zero COVID policy. More than 500 infections were reported across mainland China on Monday, the most since China's initial outbreak in the central city of Wuhan was brought under control in the middle of 2020. The spike comes as cases spiral out of control across the border in the southern Chinese territory territory of Hong Kong, where hospitals have been overflowing with patients and locals are panic buying, fearing a lockdown. A top Chinese scientist said last week that the country should aim to coexist with a virus and could move away from the zero tolerance strategy in the near future. Meanwhile, the death toll from week-long floods battering Australia's east coast rose to 20 on Tuesday after the bodies of a man and a woman were discovered in floodwaters in Sydney. Here are some reactions. Unfortunately, it's sad. So many people out of work. So many shops. No business. As you can see, like I was at the locals today. Everyone's devastated. Can't even get because all the roads are closed off due to the floods. And unfortunately, people's safety. Look, we know it's going to rain, but the almighty, how much rain we're going to get, God knows how much is going to come down, mate. When the heavens open up, they come down. But how much rain? We weren't expecting that. You know, from Tuesday till today, it hasn't stopped raining. And overnight at the high tide, like I told you, it wasn't even high and this morning. Come up, I went to sleep at 3.30, stayed up, figured my house was going to go under, but thank God it didn't even reach us. But it's pretty sad. Pretty sad. Yeah, I yeah. am. I am lucky <laughs> because yeah. you know, not that much water. But I, ne I never see the water before they come in so fast. Mm. When they come, like uh, when they get out from the car, like uh, about 30 centimeters, 40 centimeters up to here, yeah. in a 10 seconds, they come in more than half a meter. Tens of thousands of Sydney residents have been told to evacuate their homes as severe storms and flash flooding inundated swathes of Australia's largest city today. The National Weather Bureau warned of a tough 48 hours ahead for Sydney with 60,000 people subject to evacuation orders and warnings and the city's manly dam beginning to spill. Intense rainfall across Sydney flooded bridges and homes, swept away cars and even collapsed the roofs of a shopping center and a supermarket. In the Riverside suburb of George's Hall, vehicles were semi-submerged and police had to rescue people stranded in their cars by rising floodwaters. Australia has been at the sharp end of climate change with droughts, deadly bushfires, bleaching events on the Great Barrier Reef and floods becoming more common and intense as global weather patterns change. Actors Will Smith, Denzel Washington, Penelope Cruz, Kristen Stewart and other Oscar hopefuls attended the traditional luncheon ahead of the ceremony on March 27th. Take a look.
And the news continues here on Eagle News. We'll be right back. Mula noon hanggang ngayon, gabay natin ang MTRCB ratings sa matalino at responsabling panonood. Sa tamang pagsunod sa MTRCB ratings, ginagawa nating ligtas at makabuluhan ang panonood ng bawat miyembro ng Pamilyang Pilipino. Lumipas man ang panahon hanggang may Pamilyang Pilipino, andyan ang MTRCB. Today, we honor all the women around the world and join everyone in celebrating their meaningful contributions in shaping our world today. Our junior correspondents from the United Kingdom shares us the, uh, share with us the history behind International Women's Day. And we'll also find out some of the women who continue to inspire the youth in the UK. Here is correspondents Daniel Eric Celestino, Kyla Messina, and Tyrus Season. Let's take a look. I'm Daniel, I'm Kayla, and I'm Tyrese. Do you remember what day it is today? In case you're not sure, the day is International Women's Day. So, some may ask, what is International Women's Day and why is it celebrated? Well, today we invite you to travel back in time with us, looking at the history of this known event celebrated on the 8th of March. This day is really special as we remember all the women's achievements around the world. It's a way to remind us how women contributed one way or another to shape the world as we know it nowadays. This includes women's contribution in politics, written works, culture or science. One thing's for sure, they've definitely helped in contributing to the progress of our society today. When did International Women's Day first start? This special day has been observed as early as the 1900s. For instance, it was celebrated in 1909 across the United States of America. Back then, it was known as National Women's Day. But one year later, it changed, thanks to an international conference held in Denmark. Over 100 women leaders in 17 countries attended this conference, and one of them was Clara Zetkins. She proposed the idea to make Women's Day an international day. Everyone accepted her idea, and since then, International Women's Day is celebrated all around the world to honor the achievements of women. It has also been declared by the United Nations as a global holiday. The UN now celebrates this annually with different themes supporting women's rights and concerns. Is it only women who should celebrate this day? As much as it's about honouring women, this day welcomes everyone to express their appreciation for the women who inspired them. The person that I love is my mum because she always puts me and my brother first. The women that I that I admire in my life is my grandma. She's thoughtful, she's kind, and she's hardworking. I admire my mother because she is kind and she's very strong. <laughs> my mum, uh, she wouldn't normally give up. Emma Raducanu, for example, rose to fame at such a young age due to a sheer amount of determination and hard work. I admire her because she acts very selfless and is kind to others. A well-known woman that has inspired me is Malala Yousafzai. She is the youngest Nobel Prize winner and she advocates for equality and education, which I think is very important as I also believe that everyone has the right to an education. Um, I think of Princess Diana because um, as mentioned in the past, um, she was regarded as the princess of the people for her compassion and her grace for um, caring for the people. Women leaders are essential role models and I'm proud to work with dynamic and creative women every day as we lead the United Nations into a new era. 
and I wish you all the best for International Women's Day. you learned something new and that somehow you were able to participate in appreciating women around the world. Once again, I'm Tyrese, I'm Kayla and I'm Daniel from London, United Kingdom. We, we live, live in, in interesting, interesting times. times. Thanks guys and happy International Women's Day to everyone out there. As always, I'll end the day on a thoughtful note. Our ability to look back and smile at our past is proof that God's plan is to keep us moving forward. This has been Eagle News International. I'm Alma Angeles. Stay alert and stay informed because we live in interesting times. Good night.